we look, our world is facing a huge range of unprecedented challenges. So if you're a leader right now, how do you navigate your way through this? How do you make decisions in the teeth of so much uncertainty? How are you going to reconnect your people and rebuild your team so that they're fit to face the future? And what does it even mean to be a leader in such an increasingly challenging world? These and other questions I've been putting to top business leaders from across Europe, and I've had some surprisingly candid responses. So why don't you join me, Nisha Pele, for the latest episode brought to you by Sherpany of The Agenda. My guest today was a successful Olympic athlete who's climbed to the top of the insurance industry. He believes there's a great deal that the discipline of elite sports can teach business leaders. His name is Zeverin Moser. He is CEO of Allianz in Switzerland. And previously he ran the property and casualty unit of the giant Allianz insurance company in Germany. Welcome Zeverin. It's very good to have you with us on the agenda. Thank you for having me. When we last met Zeverin, you said that years and years of training as a world-class athlete, which took you to the Seoul Olympics in 1988, that taught you a huge amount about how to lead a business. Why did you say that? What does it mean? You know, as an athlete, um, normally, or most of the athletes, they think uh, about, uh, or first think about what they want to achieve uh, in their sport, uh, you know, sport life. So they might uh, decide to compete on a local, regional, national, international level. Uh, they might do that in uh, this discipline, in other disciplines, etc. So they, uh, in a way, before uh, starting uh, with their training, they think about uh, what are the goals for the next training period. And uh, this, in a way, is very similar to what we do in business. So we also have, uh, on a yearly basis, uh, you know, a planning session. Uh, we have a mid-term uh, strategic uh, cycle where we think about what do we want to achieve until, let's say, a certain period or, or a certain point in time. Okay, so it makes you very goal-oriented, creating realistic goals and plans. Yeah. That's interesting. So how did you learn as an athlete to refine those goals, to deliver on those goals? Because presumably as a young athlete, it wasn't so obvious, it wasn't so easy. Right, as a young athlete, you're not that experienced, but that's probably similar as a young business professional. You're not that experienced in, in delivering on results. So you have setbacks, uh, et cetera, that's part of the game in sport. That's probably also part of the game in many uh, of, uh, of what we do in business. So, you know, as once you have uh, defined your goals you want to achieve, then um, you obviously need to start about um, uh, how you get there. So what do I need to, to undertake um, in order to achieve the goals I have um, uh, defined for? I wish to, um, uh, to achieve as an athlete. And normally you do not do that only by yourself, but you do that with your team. So you, you might have coaches as a decathlete, as, uh, that was my sport. I had multiple coaches in different disciplines. So we were talking about, should I invest more into, you know, sprint? Should I uh, in, invest more into, uh, you know, the, the throws? Should I do more in pole vaulting? Should I do more in endurance or in weights, uh, etc.? So you think about what is missing in order to achieve the goals you have set for yourself. Did that come easily for you? prioritizing those different areas, deciding that this is where you've got to put your effort into in the next year. Was that obvious? Did it come easily for you? No, that's not easy, no. Um, I mean, some of the of your strengths and weaknesses, they are obvious because uh, decathlon is uh, is measurable. So you're, you know exactly how you compare to your benchmark um, um, colleagues. Um, but other, other areas are not that easy. Uh, because you might want to invest more into your strengths and less into your weaknesses, because at the end, that gives you a higher score in the total of the decathlon, where you then add up all the different um, points in, uh, in the disciplines. And this is um, very similar in, uh, in business. So 
we know, for example, how we perform uh, with regard to turnover, with profitability, with uh, um, customer satisfaction, etc. So we have lots of benchmarks as well in business. But at the end, then to decide where you want to invest your resources, which are normally limited, um, is you know uh, is the you know the kind of the result of a lengthy discussion you have your, with your management team, where you discuss or with your shareholder, where you discuss what do we want to do first, what do we do next, uh, etc. So that's in a way similar to uh, as you prepare yourself as an athlete. And is it possible to ask you this question? Are you the sort of person who tends to focus on your strengths or to focus on your weaknesses? Um, in business, I tend to focus on my strength. Um, it's clear that you have to have, you have to achieve a certain level uh, in all disciplines in a way. But then it's in my view clear that the a company uh, should focus on the areas where the company is strong, where you are better than the competition, where you, uh, where you are um, more likely to convince customers uh, to, to come to you and do their business with you. I think that's important in a way because there you are excellent. Everyone knows that you're excellent. So you have a good um, um, reputation in that area. And then it's easier to kind of accelerate on those uh, strong points. So the flip side of that, Severin, presumably, is that you also have to accept your limits in some areas and maybe walk away from certain areas. You can't do that as a decathlete, but you can do that as a business leader, can't you? Absolutely. I think, you know, in every business strategy and at the same time, you have to define the areas you do not want to be active in. This is sometimes much harder than uh, uh, defining the ones you want to be in because many people tend to kind of try to be everywhere. But I think a, um, a good strategy is, is um, also characterized by, by setting priorities and defining where you want to compete and where you do not want to compete. So setting strategy, Having goals, clear thinking on that seems to be one of your strengths, Severin, and you've brought a lot from sport. What about actually the implementation of the strategy? That's also a very important part of being a leader. How do you take your team and deliver on these strategies? Mm -hmm. What are your insights on that? Mm -hmm. You know, I, in my view, it's important that as you develop this strategy, you do not you should not do that by yourself or just in a very small circle. I think you have to take your company with you on the journey of defining your strategy. And um, by doing that, you also then <clears throat> uh, create a uh, buy-in by your, by your people because they, they are involved in the process of, in the process of, of uh, thinking through what might be the right strategy for us as a company. And once you have your uh, people on board in that strategic process, uh, it's, it's much, much easier to then uh, decide on the strategy and also to deliver on the strategy because the people have, uh, co you know, have worked on it as well. It's also helping you not to lose focus as you start delivering against that uh, strategic goal. Uh, sometimes um, because of, you know, whatever happens in the, in the market, etc., cetera, you, um, you risk to lose your focus in that strategy. And once you have developed that together, everyone knows what the, the overall goal of the company is. And so if, even if something goes slightly different than planned, they know where to go uh, instead of they know what to do. You were telling us earlier that as a decathlete, you had a number of coaches, obviously, who worked with you in the different disciplines. And coaches can sometimes be extremely honest and brutal, can't they, in getting an athlete to raise his or her game. So who operates in that way for you? Who provides you with that kind of really honest, sometimes brutal feedback, Severin? Yeah, there is um, not everyone, but uh, a good part of my management team um tell you know has we have a very open um, kind of discussion culture so they tell their uh, opinions on different things um so 
some of them they are you know they act as a person who gives you input even if it's uh, you know difficult um, then uh, secondly you have your um, board of directors there um, at least here in uh, in Allianz uh, Switzerland we have uh, a mixture of people from Allianz internal but also from the outside and I think the outside people because they are not involved in the you know the daily routine work etc the daily targets etc they give you um, you know a very open feedback when they believe something goes well or if something goes wrong um, most of them uh, or all of them they are not insurance people but they are uh, people from uh, you know other uh, industries so they have other experiences um, some of them are customers of us so they uh, they even experience you know the way we treat them as a customer and by doing that you get um, really honest feedback uh, from you know from that part or that side as well so what does it feel like, Zeverin, when you're in this position where you, you think you know what you're doing, you're the leader, but you get challenged by somebody at a, either at a board level or within your team? How do you mm -hmm. respond to that as an individual? Because it's not the most comfortable situation to be in, is it? Well, you know, I think it depends. Um, if you get challenged, it's the question on how you get challenged and by whom you get challenged. I think if you get challenged out of good reason, then obviously it's an enrichment for me as a CEO to get challenged because I do not know everything. Uh, I, I'm not aware of everything which goes on in my company. So if a, or a customer, if a broker tells me, listen, uh, I made this and this experience with your company, um, then um, I have to take that honest and to see how we can improve on this. Um, because otherwise we're not further developing as a company if um, if i would not accept uh, being challenged um, how could we then develop as a company i think that's in a way natural someone who doesn't do that i think over time loses ground so severin how do you handle failure as a, as a sports person you have to learn to to deal with it and as a business person too i guess Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, part of uh, delivering on a strategy always includes successes, but also areas where you're not that successful. And um, I think most important is that you allow those failures, that you accept failures as part of, uh, of a normal business life. Um, and I think it's also important that you, um, that you identify and name those failures. So that's not easy to do, Zebra. Can you, can you give us an example of when you've actually done this? You had a policy, you had your name on it, it didn't go well, and then you owned up to it to the whole organization? Yeah, um, and I'm just preparing a town hall for you know next week, I believe. And um, we're looking at our customer satisfaction scores. And um, uh, we are very well off uh, on the scores we get from our direct customers, but we got not that pleasant feedback from our intermediaries, our brokers. So uh, we lost uh, in the ranking two positions. We're now number six. And this obviously is not uh, what we want it to be. And it's also not good for our business in that uh, distribution channel. So I'm clearly addressing this to the employees, because it's not just one employee who can uh, um, help us improving on this. It needs the whole organization. It needs IT people to make sure that we have IT uh, systems in place which support the brokers. We need our salespeople looking after the brokers and we need our underwriters, um, you know, writing the business from those brokers, which means that, um, that I have to address this very um, openly, very clear in order to have the organization, um, you know, working on this. If I would not do that, um, then why should they change anything? I mean, then everything would be fine. So therefore, I believe that you really, especially internally, you have addressed those areas we are not, which are not working well. And um, that might not be an individual failure. That might be a failure of the, of the system, of the company as a whole. And then we have to work on this. 
And you've also worked outside of Switzerland. I know you've worked in the UK, you've worked in Germany for a long time. How easy is it to shift the culture of different parts of a large international organization? Because they seem to reflect kind mm -hmm. of deeply set national behavior. I think this is, I think it's difficult to really change culture, um, you know, in a sustainable manner so i think you can you can um, as a person you can kind of uh, trigger a certain development uh, with regard to culture and if you're very long in that company you can do that even more but i think you need also to to do that together with your uh, colleagues you cannot do that just by yourself it takes time and you have to have uh, multipliers in the organization which uh, help you to do that uh, but you I th I'm convinced that you can that you can uh, uh, change culture, but it's tough. It takes years, and uh, and it's not sure that this is sustainable at the end. I want to ask you a personal question, Severin. What is it like to be the leader of an organization, to be the top person, the main decision maker, ultimately, um, in the face of huge uncertainty, having to make long term decisions? You know what um i mean first of all i think it's it's one role with the co within the company obviously it's an important role but i think you know i do my job as others do their job as well so from that point of view one should not think that uh, that one has you know a you know, uh, you know a, a more important uh, role in a way than others so my business is to lead the company and uh, and others do you know treat customers in in the case of a claim etc so now obviously when you ask about the responsibility that's different you know i'm fully aware that i'm responsible for a company of three and a half as three thousand five hundred employees so if we do something wrong or if we have a you know a compliance issue which uh, which um, triggers questions on the reputation of the company etc it's not just me uh, which is, uh, you know, or who is uh, kind of, uh, you know, hampered, it's the whole company. And so therefore, it, I think as to come back to what I said earlier, it's important if you decide, if you decide to do something uh, important for the company, that this is well thought through, that it is um, also grounded and shared with your colleagues, developed with your co colleagues, that it's not just your personal um, um, opinion or point of view which uh, triggers this action but that, that it is well balanced and discussed and uh, and decided upon before you do it have you ever had sleepless nights because of this responsibility uh yes to be honest i had that not very often but i had that uh, and the last couple of uh, sleepless nights were at the beginning of co of the covid crisis where you had where we had to to care about uh, our employees so there was the you know the swiss government uh, who decided from one day to the other that everyone has to work from uh, home uh, so that was i mean it was unknown on whether that was would be working well to us it was unknown on whether we could deliver on on uh, promises to our customers it was unknown on whether our it would really work and then there was this virus, which was at that point also not that well known. So that triggered a few nights uh, with uh, very few hours of sleep, to be honest. Yeah. And where we are right now, there's still a lot of unknowns, aren't there? What is the world of work going to be like as we begin to come out of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. What is your role as a leader in setting those decisions about hybrid working, working from home. There mm -hmm. are so many options now, whereas at the beginning of the pandemic, there were no options. How do mm -hmm. you see your mm -hmm. leadership role? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I believe that, um, you know, pre or maybe previously we had kind of certain rules how our employees uh, were, you know, could work. So they could work for X hours from home. They, you know, there was kind of a book of regulations uh, how we, you know, performed our work, etc. Now, um, 
after this you know year and a half of uh, pandemic development with all the ups and downs etc um, we came to the conclusion that um, the new work in a way won't be based on rules that doesn't work we developed principles from the point of view of the company and principles uh, from the point of view of the employee and uh, these are eight principles each and along those principles it's every team member together with his team who decides on how they work you know what is best for that specific team in order to perform their work so there is no regulation no rule for the whole company so there is only these principles and based on these principles every manager decides for himself plus for his team and that's how we want to uh, tackle the next period and we'll find out on whether that works or not if it's not working then we might have to change again um, but we're convinced at this uh, point in time that uh, this is the best way to do because that allows us to give flexibility to the ground to the to the managers and the employees and i believe they will do the best for the company by doing that fascinating um so our series, this podcast series, is all about leaders musing on leadership. Do you have a final thought that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, maybe one thing, and I'm often asked, uh, you know, is there a recipe or anything like this, Joy, to be a manager? Um, and I think there is, there isn't really. But there's one thing probably um, all future managers should, uh, should keep in mind. And this is, and I always say that, um, be yourself and stay yourself. Whether you are a manager on, a, you know, on a team level, on a you know, larger level of whether you're a CEO, etc., just stay yourself. Do not change your your behavior, your uh, kind of attitude, your you know, your personality, just because you're a CEO or just because you're a high-ranked manager. Uh, that's normally not natural and people detect that relatively quickly so therefore you know stay the way you are with all your strengths with all your weaknesses work on the weaknesses but work on your strengths as well and then i think that um, you know then you're best off uh, to perform on management tasks zebra and moser thank you so much for joining us with all your plain speaking on the agenda it's been a pleasure thank you nisha thanks again